So, hello everybody. Here's Paul Scorpin, and I'm uh, sitting here in my seminar room where I teach healing and uh, actually give healings here in southern Germany in a town called Andex. And uh, it is the 21st of December, so it is traditionally known as the longest day of the year, the uh, winter solstice. Actually, sometimes it falls on the 20th and sometimes it falls on the 22nd. In any case, we're in the middle of it right now. And that means that we have uh, less daylight than we do uh, throughout the entire year. And in about three days, uh, depending on whether you're German or American, you're going to celebrate the birth of the Christ child if you're a Christian. And the birth of the Christ child, um, if, you're, if you believe in Christianity in some form or the other, celebrates the birth of uh, love, uh, light, and life in Bethlehem in a time where it was quite dark and um, because the Roman Empire was repressing uh, the people of the Holy Land and uh, for a long time. But the light per persevered and went on to teach and heal for 33 years. And three months from now, we're going to go into the Easter season, which uh, we, we, we experience both the crucifixion and then the resurrection. So if you take these as bookends, uh, what we have now coming up in three or four days uh, is the birth of the Christ child, and then three months later we have the uh, rebirth of the Christ after the crucifixion and the resurrection. It's a very powerful religious cal calendar which speaks, to, uh, uh, speaks continuously to birth and rebirth. And the reason why I'm here is because um, we've gone through a very difficult period together uh, throughout the world because we were confronted with this virus known as the COVID virus, coronavirus, creating a lot of divisions uh, between us and even within us and a lot of confusion. And uh, my uh, path has been an interesting path because some of you know that I had the very good fortune of spending the last six years of one of the greatest, with the greatest teachers and healers of all time, Daskalos. And before that, I was living in Kathmandu for two years with the University of Wisconsin and exploring uh, shamanism, Hinduism, and Buddhism and going through all the temple complexes in Nepal, in uh, Tibet, not all, but many, and also through India, north and south. And then as I got to reach uh, Cyprus, and had, the, like I said, the great blessing of many lifetimes to stay with this man, uh, I got deeply uh, initiated into inner Christianity, which has been my passion and what I've been doing for the last 27 years here in Germany. Uh, but the last few years, I've had the impulse to go off to, to other belief systems which coexisted at the times of Christ, including... Um, the belief systems which permeated Anatolia and the Greek islands, uh, which were based in Hellenic Greek belief system, uh, paganism, and uh, then uh, usurped by the Romans. And I just returned about three weeks from an incredible trip into Egypt, modern-day Egypt, but uh, as, uh, as well into ancient Egypt, which was, for me, a life-changer. And... Um, some of you know that I offer uh, seminar trips to these places uh, every year, annually, uh, including through Anatolia and also through the Holy Land. It looks like we're going to take a break from that. And through Egypt and also on the island of Patmos. And uh, one of the places that, I, that, uh, that is very important to me now is a place in southeast Anatolia, belonging to the Fertile Crescent, uh, the topper part of the Fertile Crescent, which is called, uh, the Turks have called it Taz uh, Tepela, uh, meaning stone mountain, stone hills. Uh, the most famous of these uh, complexes uh, is Gopekli Tepe. Gopekli Tepe was discovered in 1960, but then pretty much ignored and then rediscovered uh, in 1969. Uh, by um, Klaus Schmidt, uh, a German archaeologist arche 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 who started doing a dig there uh, before he passed away too early, tragically, from a heart attack. Uh, but they've been continuing to dig there, and uh, what, they've, what, they've, what they've determined is that these structures 
are uh, dating about 12,000 years ago, uh, maybe even older than 12,000 years ago, maybe 12,500 years ago, or even 12,800 years ago. And there are 12 of these. Uh, they've, they've started digging out another one about six years ago called Karan Han Tepe, which is about 60 kilometers away from Gopekli Tepe. And they're slowly digging out uh, another, 10, uh, another 10 of these tepes, very slowly. And uh, they are extraordinary, um, and they're baffling. Uh, why are they baffling? Because um, if you listen to the archaeologists, uh, they are extremely confused by, by these structures. First of all, uh, it predates uh, most of the structures we know of by at least 5,000 years. I mean, it predates Stonehenge by over 5,000 years. The pyramids of Giza, even the structures on Malta and, uh, and many other structures. The only structures which actually compete with Gopekli Tepe are found in Jordan and in modern-day Israel and also throughout Anatolia. Uh, and the archaeologists are really struggling, uh, and uh, I have not been so patient with them, and I, and I apologize for that, because in one breath they'll say we shouldn't speculate about these, these structures, and in the next breath they speculate uh, to no end about these structures. In one breath they say these people are no less sophisticated than we are today, and then in the next breath, they say uh, these people were not sophisticated enough to actually believe in divinities. Um, and they are now reluctant to call these temple complexes uh, going against Klaus Schmidt. And there I, I have to also apologize because uh, I respect Klaus, Klaus Schmidt's uh, work tremendously and also his legacy. Because uh, he he saw no he 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 had no doubt about it. He called it the uh, temples on the the cathedral on the hill, and first came the temple and then came the city. Now the recent research, uh, which is not really supported by professional carbon dating, uh, claims that these were residential areas as well, uh, and that maybe they were not even temple complexes. And I I can't accept that, but that's my problem uh, because. Uh, you know, if you if you see some of the recent discoveries, like in Karan Han Tepe, you see a, uh, a two meter thirty, a two meter thirty centimeters high man holding his phallus, his erect phallus. Um, the prevail the the current uh, theories from some of these archaeologists who are mostly German or or at least work with the German uh, team uh, claim that they are basically meeting halls uh, for for the. Um, for the transference of, of traditions. And I just can't buy that because uh, I think the emphasis is on uh, the co-creative powers of humanity. Uh, there's not only in another site, there's another man holding a penis as he's being attacked by uh, lions, okay? And there's also a beautiful uh, stella of a woman actually in the middle of giving birth, which is also 11,000 years old, which was found in Gopekli Tepe. Why do I mention this all? Because I'm about to, uh, um, I'm offering a trip there. Uh, I've been there four or five times myself with small groups. And now I've planned a trip over Easter, the Catholic Easter, uh, the end of April going into, uh, the end of March going into April. So a lot of people have holidays then. And why do I, why do I want to do it over Easter? Because uh, we're going through uh, a deep, deep birthing process uh, if you will, we're experiencing the birth of a new paradigm. Uh, and these contractions are painful, but uh, they're necessary. And uh, we can safely call uh, uh, Gopekli Tepe and Karan Han Tepe and, and Taz Tepe, we can call it the cradle of civilization, because from there we have agriculture, and from there we have belief systems, which spread out through all of Europe uh, slowly, uh, through migration. And um, some even people call it the place where the Garden Eden was located or the navel of the world. All of these indicate that this place is very, very special. And why, why is it so special to us all? Well, because it doesn't belong to any of us. You, 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 you definitely 
cannot link it to any religion which has prevailed or survived since then. And we have no idea who built them, and we don't know why they built them, and we don't know how they built them. You know, these are these are uh, columns which are as high as eight meters high, finely chiseled with animals, some of them mythological and some of them actual animals, uh, forming a beautiful circle. And now I'm speaking about Gopekli Tepe. And the, why do I speak about Gopekli Tepe? Well, we were blessed in August of this year to... Uh, to receive a paper uh, from a Turk called Nizar Polat. Uh, Nizar Polat is a professor at Haran University, not far from Chanli Ufra. And he's, the paper's in English, and it's called Utilizing GIS for the Exploration of Possible Neolithic Sites Contemporary to Gobekli Tepe. But I know that uh, Mr. Polat, uh, is his heart's really in to the uh, is really uh, is really invested in these 12 sites and what he uh, actually managed to do was to measure um, I want to show you this because to me this is extraordinary uh, uh, I'll, I'll put it in I'll, I'll embed it in the film but here you can see his map in this in this uh, article which uh, show the 12 sites of uh, Taz Teplala and What's interesting is that Gopekli Tepe is basically uh, situated in the middle and surrounding uh, Gopekli Tepe are the other 11 sites, almost, almost in a circle. Uh, I can show you on a map that I had commissioned and uh, this is a map uh, on my website dedicated to these sites. And there you see Gopekli Tepe in the middle and then you see an equal number of tepes on this side and another grouping of tepes on this side. And it says a lot about Gopekli Tepe. And not only that, he measured the elevations of, of these tepes uh, in relationship to in relation to the sea level. And Gopekli Tepe is over 735 meters above sea level, making it the highest tepe of all the tepes. And it has a bird's eye view from Gopekli Tepe to uh, Tazli Tepe, where I've been, to Kurt Tepe, where I've been, to Kran Han Tepe, where we've been, Habet Suvan Tepe, Gurkha Tepe, and Yeni Malhala. We have a storm outside. That means one, two, three, four, five, six, seven other tepes can be seen from Gopekli Tepe, and no other tepe uh, offers a bird's eye view into to the other tepes as much as Gopekli Tepe does. So we can safely say, even though these digs are relatively new, Gopekli Tepe is only 5 to 6% uh, dug out. Uh, Karanan Tepe, maybe 4 or 5% dug out. Still, we can safely say that Gopekli Tepe is probably in the middle of these tepe complexes. And um, so this trip is going to be, it's going to be offering us a, uh, a travel to the land of the morning, of the morning sun, okay? Uh, in these older belief systems, like the Hellenic belief system, they believe that Apollo used to bring the sun every morning on his on his uh, carriage over the sky uh, to Europe and to America. Was not really discovered or wasn't. You know. And in the Egyptian belief system, they believe that Amun Ra used to bring the sun every morning uh, in his bark boat over the sky. And every day was a rebirth for these folk. Every day was a gift and every day was a rebirth. And because we're going through a birth and a rebirth right now, I think it's very important for us to go to a place like uh, the Twelve Tepes and spend time there without any preconceptions when it's possible. It's very difficult to, to avoid them, I can tell you firsthand. Uh, and without any... Uh, just open ourselves up to these tepes because these tepes speak to us in a way that uh, transcends the intellect. It even transcends uh, the heart. It is. A, it speaks to us in a way uh, which is primordial and timeless. You know, I've stood before Gopekli Tepe at least six, seven times, and I've I've explored Karanhan Tepe. And last November, with a small group of people, we went to as many tepes as possible, which was extraordinary. And uh, each one of these tepes is is unique. 
and has its own frequency, if I can say that. Uh, that's another theory that, that I have, which I won't go into in this talk. But it has its own frequency and it has its own, it has its own uh, uh, energy. You know, so, so, for example, uh, in Gopekli Tepe, there's hardly any human figures. And in Karan Han Tepe, uh, there's quite a few human figures there. So this means that they're related, uh, but each one of them is independent of the others and somehow connected energetically. So, as I said, I'm offering this trip now, probably in English and German, uh, and I welcome anybody uh, who, have, who, who is interested in spirituality, who is interested in archaeology, who is interested in world culture, and just interested in experiencing probably, and I can, I can tell you this uh, from my experience, there's no place in the world you can go, no place in the world you can go, which is, is as extraordinary as uh, these 12 complexes. Uh, and trust me, I've been to many of these places uh, many times. Uh, and still, uh, uh, it, it, it's almost like you're standing on the precipice of the primordial when you're there. It's almost like you can fall into something which is post-existence and pre-existence both. And I, and I tell you, uh, you know, I have a longing to go back there. And just uh, as far as what it's like with us to do a trip, you can visit my website, which is uh, one of the most comprehensive web websites uh, dedicated to this area, with a full library and some videos, and uh, also with a seminar calendar of what we offer. And we've, we have a hotel in the middle of Chanli Ufra. Chanli Ufra is called the uh, City of the Prophets because they celebrate the birth of Abraham there, the father of the Judaic Christian tradition. And pilgrims come from all over the world to honor Abraham. And even the great prophet Job, who suffered endlessly, uh, has a grave there. And even under the uh, sacred uh, pond of, of Chanli Ufra is another uh, tepi, which we're not allowed to dig out. But they did find there the Urfa man, which is an 11,000-year-old uh, figure uh, carving of a man, uh, one meter eighty, one, one nearly two meters high, uh, which is the first, uh, which is the oldest uh, figure of a human being uh, yet found in the world until maybe the one they found a couple months ago in Karan Hantepi. So the hotel that we're staying in is a very modern but 400-year-old hotel. And I've booked the entire hotel for us. That means there's 14 rooms. And they'll make dinner for us there. And from there we can go. Uh, we're going to take uh, our private buses to as many tepis as possible, uh, as, as, as much as we're allowed. Uh, with me as a, as a guide, a silent guide, and with Yuchil, uh, my, my, my brother and my friend, as, the, uh, as a licensed Turkish guide. And also we'll take a trip to uh, Gaziantep and visit the largest mosaic museum in the world and, um, and other places. And it is an extremely, extremely powerful trip, uh, which... Uh, if any true seeker of, of the truth and of humanity and the riddle of humanity, anybody at home in Dusklis' teachings, anybody at home in the teachings of, of, of Judaism or, or Islamic uh, teachings, in Buddhism or Hinduism, uh, you should go there at least once in your lives to stand in complete awe and respect for what our ancestors have managed to do Recently, there was a video on YouTube of, 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 of a survey of all sites dating back 10, 12,000 years ago throughout the world, cave drawings, uh, primitive uh, buildings, uh, and they're all very impressive and very beautiful, but uh, when, when you compare that to what they managed to do in Gopekli Tepe, Karan Han Tepe, and these other tepes, uh, it is uh, it is uh, child's play. I'm sorry. I don't uh, I don't I don't mean to offend our ancestors in America, and South America, or in Europe, or anywhere else. But it's uh, 
uh, when you stand in front of a, a, these these in, these uh, circular enclosures uh, constructed of these of these uh, columns which are, are are chiseled out of one stone, uh, you're just talking about something out of out of the league. That's why everybody's so baffled by this right now. Uh, including the archaeologists, they have no way to, they have no way to comprehend this, you know, which is why they're throwing out theories uh, left and right uh, to the press to make it even more spe spectacular. And there, I, I, I warn you all, be very careful until we have really uh, solid uh, carbon dating uh, that can be repeated and repeated and repeated. Uh, because I'll tell you one thing, uh, and this is just an example that I know firsthand. Uh, on the island of Patmos, they built a beautiful monastery to the Apostle John, who received the Book of Revelations on the island. And it's built on the remains of an Artemis temple. It doesn't matter. And the, 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 the monastery of John is about a thousand years old. And during the construction of the, monetary, of the monastery of John, the workers were not allowed to build houses or residences around the monastery. So they were living mostly in a town called Campos, about six, seven kilometers away from the monastery. So theoretically, they had to travel every day there to work on the monastery. But a thousand years ago, we had a problem with pirates in the, in the Mediterranean, in the Aegean. And that placed the workers in danger because they were too close to the coast. And so they approached the uh, Archbishop of, of, of John's monastery, and they said, you know, unless we can build ho houses directly on, uh, on the monastery, uh, we're going to leave the island. And the, uh, uh, reluctantly, the church agreed to that. Now it's called Hora, one of the most expensive places to buy a house in, in the world. And that's an example. So when, when, when you hear reports now, which you'll hear more and more, from the archaeologist. Also, there was an article in a Swiss magazine yesterday, or newspaper yesterday, uh, claiming that because they were qu quoting one of the main archaeologists there, that they were living there and they were brewing beer there. Then that does not uh, dismiss the fact that these are temple complexes. First of all, two things can be possible. One thing is, is that when they were building these complexes, the workers lived nearby to be protected. Okay. And to be close to the to the to the area uh, what they were building. Secondly, um, without without proper carbon dating, and without any date, dating dating inflation uh, being performed, uh, we can't say if the people came later. In other words, if the if the temple complexes were built like uh, Kopekli Tepe, and existed there without any buildings around it residential buildings around it for 2,000 years, and then for whatever reason they abandoned Gopekli Tepe, because they did, they covered it with earth. Uh, and then the people moved there because the stones were there and started building houses, then that would be another, another expla explanation. And before you dismiss the work of Klaus Schmidt, be sure that you have proper carbon dating, and be sure that your theory is fully tested and can be rep replicated, okay? That's all I ask. And who am I to, to ask that? I'm, I'm nobody to ask that. But, you know, what I say, there's basically two camps now. There are bulls in a china shop, and that's the archaeologist. And then, don't get me wrong, there are my bre brethren who are deeply involved in spirituality who are like kids in a candy shop, you know, because they're so fascinated with megalith megalithic stones. And I think these stones are incredibly very impressive. I mean, a 12, uh, eight meter high uh, pillar is, is, is incredible, especially when it's 12, over 12,000 years old. But then I ask, then I, I, I beg you, look behind the people that did that and look behind their belief system and who did that, you know. So uh, personally, I try to stay away from the kids in the candy shop and the bull in the china shop. And I, that's what our trip offers is something more neutral. Uh, of course, we're going to be fascinated with Gopekli Tepe. You can't help it. And of course, we're going to, the mind wants to understand why and how and, uh, you know, try to place it into some historical context and uh, some sort of, uh, and you can't, you just can't, because we're talking about com complexes which are over 12,000 years old. So it begs from us humility, Okay. It big, we should be humble in the face of Gopekli Tepe and Karanhan Tepe. 
as long as the humility, uh, humility, humility uh, uh, survives, then let, let us try to stay in humility and excitement and in awe. Okay? So if you go to my website, either theosis.com or to the new website uh, dedicated to Taz Tepleta Le, uh, Rise uh, Enough German Travel, you'll find the... the uh, You'll find the trip in, in uh, Easter listed there with, with in some detail what it cost, how you get to Ch- uh, Chanli Ufra, you fly over Istanbul. I can answer all your questions about that. And uh, if you can't make it this Easter, there's already the second trip planned for next, uh, next, uh, next autumn because it gets pretty hot there in the summer. So the best time to visit is in springtime and in autumn uh, before the rainy season and before the heat sets in. And uh, if you can't make it this year or next year, uh, I plan to be offering these trips uh, routinely uh, if there's enough interest. Okay, so I'm going to put this on YouTube, and, uh, and uh, if you have any questions, please contact me. And take care and have a blessed uh, holiday season, Hanukkah, and, uh, and, and Merry Christmas. And uh, I wish you all really a very, very fruitful 2024, the winds are blowing strongly here around my seminar rooms. Uh, the leaves are blowing everywhere. And I wish you a lot of peace and a lot of joy and a lot of uh, love uh, in the coming year uh, inside of yourselves and between each other and between different uh, people. Okay. Take care, everybody. Thank you for listening. Bye now.